come to Washington, you drink out of the Yeti. Welcome to the New York Times podcast, your Don't It Always Seem to Go of music, news, and criticism. I am your host, John Caramonica. Joni Mitchell never lied. That is Raised on Robbery, a live version from the recent Joni Jam at the Gorge which happened a few days ago, and maybe by the time you get this, maybe like a little over a week ago, Joni Mitchell, Joni Mitchell is back. She's back like she left something. She's back. (laughs) She did. She did. She did. She actually left something, and now she's back for it. That's actually how this is working. And so on this week, we're going to talk about this recent Joni Jam and Joni's return. We're going to talk about the Brandy Carlisle career resuscitation program that Joni Mitchell has been on in the last 12 months, roughly. And we're going to talk a little bit more broadly about Joni's career. We are doing this, of course, with Lindsay Zolads. LZ, what's good? Hey. Almost fresh off the plane, one day removed. Still, like off time zones, you went to Washington. That's, you still, we're still adjusting. My mind is still at the gorge. My body is here, but my spirit is... I suppose probably better than the other way around if we're keeping it a buck. It's real. Okay, so just to set the scene, Joni's performance in the Joni Jam, which also had guest appearances, was part of a larger festival organized by Brandy Carlisle. And you went and you reviewed that performance. And we are going to get to that. But I think we have to start last year. We have to start it in Newport, where there was a surprise, quote unquote, surprise, Joni Mitchell performance, also during Brandy Carlisle's set, if I'm not mistaken. The videos from that performance traveled incredibly widely on social media. I am not, this, this made me will not surprise regular listeners of podcasts, but I am not a big Joni Mitchell stan. My primary interfacing with Joni Mitchell is my desire for Taylor Swift to make a Joni Mitchell type album. You know, Snow Shots is just not what I was raised on, not the thing that I'm most excited about. But I watched all those videos and I was like, damn, this is good. This is actually good. So can we talk a little bit about that moment, the quality of it and the suddenness and surprise of it? Joni makes this appearance last July at the Newport Folk Festival. And this is coming after this medical event that she had in 2015, she had a brain aneurysm. And if I'm not mistaken, was unconscious for several days before she was found. So not to put it in crass music writer terms, but I was on obituary watch that night. I think there was a widespread fear that she was not going to survive this. And what the past two performances now that she's given since recovering from this aneurysm, that she had to learn how to walk and to speak again, let alone sing, that has just been this incredible show of will and human spirit that I think transcends even the musical aspect of it, that there's an incredible power to watching this woman who very nearly came back from the dead to have this kind of like second chance, not only at performing, but being appreciated for the generational talent that she most certainly is and always was and was perhaps never quite recognized on the level of someone like Bob Dylan, who album for album, I think her discography goes just as hard, if not more, like, let's go. Let's go. Can I add one thing, which is, I think... And again, you talk about music writer talk and the crassness of obituary watch and stuff. All fair, all things I've lived through on any number of occasions. We know, having been on this side of the game for a long time, that sometimes like the economy of reassessment on the internet, for many years, I would say it was actually not very good. Things tilted to the new. And then there is an economy of reassessment that's like anniversary based or clicking 10 years of blank, 20 years of blank. I find those things dim and vile and unpleasant as concept. Forgive the phrasing, but she came by the reassessment. Honestly, P. 
people were confronted with the idea that she might no longer be around. And it forced people to reckon more seriously with the music and with the catalog. And Joni had not put out a lot of records. Maybe she'd put out a couple records in the 2000s. But, you know, we're talking about records from 30, 40 years ago. Just one. Yeah. Yeah. But primarily, we're talking about much older music. But it was a rare example to me of a kind of right sizing of a legacy while the artist was still alive. There was a an interview with CBS News that she gave right after the Newport performance. She was joking about it and she said, having a brush with death really softens people to you. And I think that comment also, like she said it with a little chuckle. And something else that I think we have to say right off the bat is just how much fun she seems to be having with this whole moment. I think that's part of the appeal too, that when we think about this like reckoning with someone's career and their legacy and even this brush with death, she is carrying all of it with such a lightness and just, "Eh, this is fun. Look at this. That's not to say that the quality of these performances have not been astonishing, which they have been, and we're going to talk about that. But I think there's something about the attitude that she's bringing to all of this fanfare that is really kind of refreshing and she's not taking it all too seriously because these are institutions that and people in some cases that weren't recognizing her when she was putting these records out or were taking for her for granted in some way. She has said multiple times, I don't know the exact year that she got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but it was way too late. And she's called them out for that and just it seems to be as she gets these more and more laurels hung around her neck in this way, she's as amused by it as anyone. You know, she received earlier this year the Gershwin Prize of Popular Song from the Library of Congress. You know, it's just getting all these sorts of lifetime achievement awards like that. And she's having fun with it. She's not taking any of this too seriously, which was really on display at, at the show that I saw at the Gorge. Before we do get to the Gorge thing, let's talk, though, a little bit about the Newport show. And I remember I I found your piece at the time, like, very rhapsodic and, like, very powerful and very much in keeping, again, with an emotional intensity that I personally did not expect to feel from watching those clips. And I think part of it is knowing the backstory, but some of it is whatever the kind of joy that was embedded in those performances, the kind of the joy and relief embedded in those performances. It was like extremely tactile and hearable in those songs. What really, when you think back to that performance, what really struck you most about that show? For the record, I know you weren't there. We watched it on the internet, just like everybody else. I am a Joni head in our little chat right now. I have a reference from the Mingus album as my username. I am, I'm going deep here. But I think that there is something to be said for your experience of the show, John, that, you know, you didn't have to be a Joni head to be moved by the performance. I was getting texts about that from friends of mine that don't even like follow music that much or don't even follow like pop culture that much. It's transcended the -the run-of-the-mill discourse in a way that it became this like mainstream moment. I think some of that was just needing these stories of resilience and kind of triumph over an illness in the wake of COVID. I think it just hit a real feel-good spot. But beyond that, like you said, there was something musically masterful about these performances and this sort of new quality of her voice that had emerged in her older age. She's 79 now, was I believe 78 at the time of the Newport, the Newport performance. And I think a place to start in talking about this too is I'm sure a lot of people who did not grow up on Joni's records and are coming to her later, I feel like an actual cultural touch point for a lot of people is the love actually scene that uses Joni's 2000 recording of Both Sides Now. It's like the most like tear jerky scene in in the movie. Let's listen to that recording. Obviously, we cannot watch the scene, but imagine the scene. You can if you want to pause and Yes, you go yes, go look on Hulu or wherever it is, but imagine the scene as you listen to this. I'm 
looked at love from both sides now, from a give and take, and still somehow... That- recording was made in 2000. It's a re-recording of a song she wrote very early in her career that became one of her first hits. And then she re-records it in the voice of a much older woman who had done a lot of living. She Taylor Swift did it? A little bit. Joni's version. It's Joni's version. I'm They're both Joni's version. They're all Joni's. Yes. But there's a gruffness to her voice. She was a big cigarette smoker and there are some Joni fans that are like really get on her about (laughs) that think she somehow ruined her voice or something. I find there to be just incredible pathos and life in the way that her voice had changed in that recording and to listen to them side by side. This is a song about growing older and losing illusions and the wisdom that you gain through living life. It became a, in the texture of the song, these the distance between these two recordings. So then she sings that song in 2022 on stage at Newport, and it means something entirely else. That it's this third act, I would say, in her career as a performer. And there's, yes, there's like a, there's a depth to her register and this just like voice of wisdom that is really powerful and stirring and at the same time technically there. Joni was known on the earliest records that were thinking about her and Blue and a song like Carrie or California had this really bird-like falsetto and was in some ways super duper feminine and in just the note she was hitting was known as this kind of willowy folk singer She's lost that register over time, as most singers of that scale would. But there's a new voice and there's this sort of richness to the lower register of her voice that you're starting to hear on that 2000 version of Both Sides Now. But it really comes out in the Newport performance. It's her, but it's a new Joni at the same time, too. Since we've just listened to the 2000 performance, and let's listen to the Newport performance. Absolutely. Don't let them know. No, don't give yourself away. Oh, I've looked at love from both sides now. From give and take. At the Newport set, this is an example of a song where the new, this current recording or performance suggests a new Joni or a new type of approach. Was the rest of the set similar in the sense that it created almost like a new character for Joni? Or were people mostly getting versions of the songs that they probably would have identified with or felt comfortable with already? I think something that has really come out in her new performances of these old songs is just how much room for interpretation is left in them and how these are songs that can contain all sorts of depths that aren't necessarily there on the surface or if you're reading the words off of a page. Like, they're really songs that are able to transform based on who's singing them, how they're singing them, and in what context they're singing them. And I think that's come through, like, in the performance of the circle game as well, which has like both sides now come to take on new meanings as she's singing as an older woman. There's a certain whimsical, youthful quality to the original recordings, but there's a real gravitas now just through the way that she is inhabiting these songs. But I also think the other big touchstone, and I think one of the only songs that she really sang lead on herself was she did a version of the Gershwin song Summertime that was stunning. She performed that at the Gorge and has also performed it at the Gershwin Prize ceremony that she received that prize in earlier this year. It was broadcast on PBS. It's really great. But she's taken that on. And something that I was thinking watching these different videos of her doing Gershwin is like how in some ways Yes, she's, I think we're having this conversation about 
giving her rightful place in a canon that includes Bob Dylan and the Beatles and whoever else, Van Morrison, whoever else you want to say about. I think in her mind, she's thinking Gershwin and Beethoven. She always had... I think a very lofty sense of who her peers were and for good reason and earned. So I I hear in her making Summertime her new hit single, she's (laughs) at the same time like singing both sides now. And to me, those are both standards now. Like those are standards on the same level. So I think she's like implicitly making that argument too. I hadn't really thought about that in regards to how older performers revisit their earlier material. But We tend to think of a standard as 10 different people have worked into their repertoire and therefore it becomes this kind of thing that can be molded by anybody but is recognizable. But it requires multiple people or multiple voices over time to to make that choice, obviously outside of the kind of songbook cabaret universe. But it's interesting what you're suggesting, which is that for Joni, she did that work herself. I hadn't really thought of it that way. Like plenty of people have sung that song and there are some brilliant versions of it. Annie Lennox did an outstanding job performing it at the Gershwin Prize Ceremony and she brought something out of that song that I had never heard before. She was doing this sassy finger point. It was incredible. You have to watch it if you haven't. But yeah, I I think that's an interesting point that in inhabiting this song that she wrote, at different stages in her life and interpreting it in a different way each time, she can make her own case to make it a standard. And I think that's what's happening with some of these songs. We should come back to this idea because this is actually, I feel this is really fertile and I don't know that I've read anything about that or someone will just rip it off because we've talked about it. So anyway, uh, you know, it's off to the races, I guess. (laughs) Okay, before we get to the Gorge performance. I'm writing it down, though. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Whoever can type it out fastest. (laughs) I do want to bring up one thing about the Newport show, which is maybe the one thing about those videos that unsettled me. Let's say you are a teenager in Hollywood, right? Or at a place where you might run into famous people and I'm going to do something that's visual. So you'll see what I'm doing. And then I'll just have to explain it. So it's like, you might stumble on a famous person, right? Maybe you want to ask them for a photo or maybe you kind of want to be sneaky about it, but you want people to know, I just saw this famous person, right? So it's like, you might hold up your phone for a selfie with the famous person behind you. Ah, look where I'm at. Look, hey, check out, check what I've got. Look at it. Justin Bieber right here. Right. The face of Brandy Carlisle, who brought Joni out at that performance and others, I felt like that energy was the same energy. And it made me uncomfortable. It made me feel like she was being wheeled out like a carnival act or something. And obviously, I'm sure that's not true. I just remember there were a bunch of tweets about it at the time. There have been some funny but not totally generous tweets about the relationship between Brandy Carlisle and Joni Mitchell in the wake of the Gorge performance. Just Google, just look on Twitter, do a Twitter search. You'll see the ones I'm talking about. I don't, it, they're amusing. They're raw, but they're amusing. But that energy, it was the one thing that, that really stressed me out about those Newport videos of like, we did a spectacle and I wonder how that felt in this performance at the courts, like was that energy still there this go round with nine months of perspective or 12 months of perspective? I'm excited to address this because I know that you're not alone in having that reaction. I've spoken with a few people that also had that take. (laughs) I don't (laughs) have that. Yeah. (laughs) Take. So here's, here is my, thing about it. I interviewed Brandy around a package that we did about the 50th anniversary of Joni Mitchell's Blue. So Brandy, at the time that I had interviewed her, had recently performed a concert where she did Blue, the whole album herself. And I believe Joni was there and Joni was like assisting in, maybe not assisting in like the arrangement, but like she had Joni's approval to do that. Brandy Carlisle is one of those artists who for a multitude of reasons, just some people have a very polarized reaction to her. 
And I think that part of that is because there is an essential quality about her as a performer and as like a public figure right now that I find to be a little bit, maybe not even a little bit, just the opposite of how Joni has inhabited her role, which is I find Brandy to be someone very comfortable within industry and the music industry. Someone described her to me as very Grammys. And yeah, she is. And I'm sure like Savage. she wouldn't take that as a slight. There is a comfort there. <laughs> some of us would. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. But some also might say like, yeah, I have a bunch of Grammys. So I think that she's someone who feels, let me finish here. Because I feel like she feels a comfort with that whole apparatus and the machine, the star maker machinery behind the popular song to quote Joni Mitchell. and. Joni being the one who wrote that line with sort of a side eye, like doesn't and always, I think, felt very skeptical of both institution and industry and any sort of entity that didn't give her due. And she has every right to feel that way because I think she has been treated horribly in the press for decades. The things written about her in the 60s and 70s are insane. If you go and look up some of the things that Rolling Stone actually published about her, she has endured being an outsider while still being an incredibly popular artist. So is your take basically like, even if it's light tacky, potentially, this is all for the good? Yeah. And I think that this doesn't happen without Brandi Carlisle, regardless of what you think about Brandy and her music and her intentions. I happen to think it's mostly genuine. Is she getting more attention from this? Sure. It can be genuine. The thing that I'm proposing and the thing that you're proposing are not mutually exclusive. Sure. Not to be all TikTok about it, but it can still be, it can be genuine, but ick at the same time. I do think that they have this genuine musical friendship. None of these performances happen without Brandy both because I think Joni was not necessarily interested in reasserting her place. She was like, screw it, I'm going to go paint. She really considered herself to be more of a painter in the last 20 years of her art making. Part of that was because she didn't feel respected by the industry that she was in. Speaking of painting and Joni in the art world, this would be a good time if you want to pause the show and Google Joni Mitchell, David Hockney. Those photos from a few years ago when she goes to the Hockney exhibit and they're there and she's holding hands with him. She's wearing an insane, crazy sweater. Like, please drop the ID on the sweater because like I would like to wear a sweater. Strong yeah, Strong incredible fits. outfits across the board. This would be a great moment. Just go look at those photos if you want to get a vibe on how Joni Mitchell's living in like the late 2010s. Soak up that energy. I'm into that energy. Yeah. Anyway. But to that point, I think she felt more comfort in the art world in the last 20 years than in the music world. When she's recovering from this aneurysm and there is this outpouring of support from the musical community that she it has to be said, too, that she is incredibly well respected among musicians. She worked with Herbie Hancock and... Jaco Pastorius and Charles Mingus. Jazz heads have a respect for Joni. Shaka Khan is friends with her. You know, all across the board, she has these relationships. And as she's recovering and undertaking this incredible challenge to, to walk and speak again and get herself back, she's hosting these jam sessions and musicians are coming over playing songs for her, playing their renditions of her songs, almost like offerings to her. And what happens is over time, she starts singing along to parts of it or she starts playing percussion or something. Like she's starting to contribute. And there is a way in which that environment, I think, was literally therapeutic for her and allowed her to start singing again, to start working on the strength of her voice and feeling comfortable just having fun playing music again. So I think that this is, while yes, it is like a ticketed concert and an event at Brandy Carlisle's festival and at her Newport set, 
there's a sense that I think is part of what makes those videos so powerful that you are in the process of watching Joni Mitchell get herself back. And get her flowers in real time, basically. Yeah, but even beyond that, I think just this physical act of this voice that was so important to the culture and made so many people feel so many things, this voice that had vanished coming back in front of our eyes and ears, that was really the thing that made the Gorge performance so profound to witness for me is I she was hitting notes that I never expected her to hit again. I never expected her to sing again. So there was this sense of recovery. And I and I do think part of that in a strange way, because I mentioned she was a notoriously big smoker. And someone emailed me with a theory that she's had to stop smoking since recovering from this health event. And that in a way, like it's restored parts of her range. Okay, maybe let's talk. And this is a good time to arrive at in more detail what you saw at the gorge. I have to set the scene first. Have you ever been to the gorge? I have traveled for many shows in my time at the New York Times. You are now traveling for shows in your time at the New York Times. I've been to some wacky places. I have been to some unexpected corners of the United States. I have not been to the gorge. So tell us what that was. The gorge is in the middle of nowhere, I have to say. And I I am proud of myself for reporting this story while not having a driver's license. Yeah, I heard. Okay, I heard whispers. <laughs> I heard whispers. Uh, I was that told, there were some challenges with arrival. But I got there and I got back and I wrote my piece and I witnessed some greatness. So that's all that matters now. All of the details have fallen away. But I, let me just say, like, to set the scene, yeah. I was told when trying to get an Uber somewhere, I was told, quote, we really don't have Uber here. I wish we did. And then I replied, I wish that you did, too. Yeah, not nah, that's not wavy. It's not wavy. It felt like this pilgrimage. Like, nobody just happened to be there. <laughs> like, oh, what's going on this weekend at the Gorge? I guess I'll check out this Joni Mitchell show. People had come from all over the country, all over the world to be there. And there there was a sense of community. I think that just like the fact of the travel and that a lot of Joni's great songs are about travel and these sort of voyages. So it's like already setting the emotional scene for this. In some ways, it started out similar to the Newport set, although the, obviously the great difference was that this was announced this was ticketed, you know, it was the first time in over 20 years that you could buy a ticket to see a Joni Mitchell show. That brought out people who had been waiting 20 years for this opportunity. I really wish that people put together custom outfits like they did at the Eras tour. Oh, John, did they ever? Yo! There were... Talk it. Talk that talk. I saw custom denim jackets. I saw berets. I saw groups of women wearing the same shirt. It really was Eras tour. For people in their 60s. Wow. Yeah. But then okay, that's people lit. in their 20s and 30s too. Like I saw a lot of mother-daughter groups. I actually Killer. I got a ride. My, my saviors of <laughs> the gorge, Liza and Mia, a mother-daughter duo that very graciously let me ride in their cab because mine did not show up. So shout out to them. Shout out Liza and Mia. There were families there. There were people that you could tell had been friends forever. Like, it was just a vibe. And this sense of anticipation of not really knowing how much is she going to sing? How much is it going to be other people? It's billed as a Joni jam. It's not billed as a Joni Mitchell concert. So there's already this expectation, like, it's not going to be just her out there with a guitar singing her hits. And something we should mention, too, about the Brandy Carlisle of it all is that at Newport, partially because of aspects of her recovery and also partially just of certain notes that she is not hitting anymore, she's singing in a different register. Brandy Carlisle is singing lead on a lot of the songs. I thought it was very interesting to watch the eye contact between them and the Newport set, it was improvisational. It was like, 
watching two people improving in a, or maybe one person improving Brandy and then reacting to Joni in this way of almost holding her hand musically. Okay, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Because you are humbling me. That is the positive aspect of the Brandy Carlisle presence during the Newport set videos. At that performance, there needs to be someone there doing that and like almost like air traffic controlling a tiny bit yeah, of like yeah. yeah. And and also that's the expectation that we have going into this. The Gord show was something else. And from I think it was the second song that she played, which was Night Ride Home from her 1991 album of that name, which already that choice as that's your second song in the set was already just, whoa, she's going deep. Like she's not just playing Big Yellow Taxi and we're going to sing along. Like she's she's going to go deep into the catalog. Let's listen to that because I feel like that's not something that we would otherwise listen to. This is the live version from the the first time Joni Mitchell's Night Ride Home has been played on podcast podcast. live at the gorge, live at the gorge. She opened with Big Yellow Taxi, and it's the sing-along vibe that that we had come to. Everybody on stage is taking certain vocal parts. It's a communal thing. Who else is on stage? Roll call it. So many people on stage. Annie Lennox, the god. Major. That was most exciting for me. Wendy and Lisa from Killer. The Revolution, Prince's Band. Come on. Great. Great. Marcus Mumford, your fave. Maybe they should have not gotten him an Uber. Just throwing that out there. He played good drums. I'm going to say that. He played good jumps. That's my uh, great gowns, beautiful gowns. Definitely one of the most disorienting live review experiences I ever had was reviewing a Mumford & Son show. Probably, I think it was at Barclays, maybe, or The Garden. Probably Barclays, I think. And just, I I had not had an experience like that in a room of that size uh, of feeling like at odds with the rest of the room. I hadn't had an experience like that since maybe reviewing Jack Johnson at the Garden, which was among the most horrific nights of my professional career, partly because everyone was standing and I was sitting. Anyway, that's just a brief tangent. I recognize your trauma. Thank you. you. Shout out to the Mumford. Shout out to Marcus for drumming. Great. Lucius, who are doing backing vocals. Okay. Not bad. Yeah. I thought they did a very good job, actually. I messed with early Lucius. Yeah. Yeah. And just so many people on stage and Brandy Carlisle, obviously, goes without saying. But something that I thought was very characteristic of this and rare is, okay, so Annie Lennox is there. She comes out with everybody else and is sitting with everyone else. And there's no, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Not doing the, oh, was that the 1989 tour? It's none of that. <laughs> there is no, like, Unrolling, the, it truly was a jam. Everybody was out there the whole time. Not a ton of ego going on. They played for three hours. It was wild. Like the Newport thing was one thing. I think she played 13 songs at Newport and did not sing lead on on most of them, I think. Did on a few. There's questions like, what is her stamina like? And this is a full year later. She played for three hours. It was a 24-song set. We're talking like Eras Tour <laughs> level length. <laughs> there was a point where probably 12, 10, 12 songs in, Brandy was like, guys, we're like not even halfway through the set. And everyone kind of gasped. What I saw was a performer just trying to say to people musically in every possible way, I'm still here and I still have things to say. I still can do this better than you thought. And basically just literally saying, I'm not dead yet. It was the most I'm not dead yet of anything I've ever seen. And I think something about that Night Ride Home performance that I wanted to highlight was that was the moment that I think everyone realized her voice has gotten stronger since Newport. She was hitting notes and there was a fluidity in the way she was tackling melody that was not there a year ago 
what it showed to me was that she's been working on this. She was determined to show up to this performance play for three hours. There were breaks in her singing because other people were performing the songs. But even when they were performing her songs, she would sometimes like cut in unexpectedly and just start singing one of the verses. It really was a show of stamina and willpower and spirit that was very moving and also musically very good. It felt very optimistic in that moment. Given the optimism, which is what you're describing, Did it seem to portend something or did it seem like something that was bounded? Newport was a moment. We didn't know if it was leading to something and we treated it as such. We treated it as an isolated thing that was special. Was your meta understanding of this show that this too is an isolated moment that should be treated as special or is this stage setting for potentially, whether it's music, touring, just anything of that nature? Was this the beginning of a new era? Or was this, hey, I now have built myself up to where I can deliver a show of this length and this scale, and maybe we're going to do it once. Or maybe we'll do it two more times three years from now. How did it feel to you? I think that it feels like everyone on stage still doesn't know. I don't think she's going to go on tour. And I think that's part of why non-Uber having place be damned, I was going to be there as, as hard as it was to get there. And there was a sense among people, if you've never seen Joni Mitchell live before, this is a chance to do it. And there's nothing else on the schedule. And maybe she'll perform something like this in a few other cities. She might be well-suited for like the classic residency model. Honestly, maybe. Like imagine just this once a month or something. There's a quality of just fun and goofing off about it that I don't think I've fully described yet. My girl was drinking Pinot Grigio out of a Yeti on stage. Hell yeah. She was having a ball. Real Housewives of the Gorge, huh? The wine was a flow in on stage. And I have to say, I saw Brandy Carlyle's performance with the high women the next night. They played at the Gorge the following night and she was hurting on stage and admitted it. She was like, that wasn't like prop wine we were drinking. <laughs> if you ever were going to appreciate Brandy Carlyle, I feel like hungover Brandy Carlyle on stage, just regretting it a little bit would have been the one to endear you. Fair, Perhaps I, my I accept favorite that. Brandy Carlyle yet. So there's a joviality to these performances. She starts telling these stories that are just incredible. She has a Dylan story and a Prince story. And the more the night went on, the more she was getting chatty and opening up in this way. And I think it needs to be said, too, that Joni Mitchell was known as someone for most of her career who didn't have a lot of respect for the people that were considered her peers. There are stories in biographies about her of just not having a ton of respect for like the other people on the pop scene at any given time. And part of that is because she had really moved on to embracing jazz by that point. But she was not someone to have flattering things to say about a lot of people in the press. And when you got praise from her, it felt very genuine. She's not a bullshitter and never has been in her career so that Many of these artists on stage with her are from a younger generation, and there's a level of removal there. There's the motherly or even grandmotherly quality to what she represents. Did it feel like it was going both ways in the sense that obviously everybody from the younger generation is looking up in some kind of awe or reverence? But did she, did Joni seem to also understand that part of her role now is essentially maternal or parental? She had some very sweet praise for like Alison Russell was on stage and and accompanied her on clarinet for a few songs. Mostly they did a cover of Young at Heart to close out the set, which in anyone else's hands would be so corny, but it worked and it was so heartfelt. And Alison Russell did a beautiful clarinet solo. And Joni said before the song, she is the most beautiful clarinet player in the world. And do you have like Joni Mitchell say that? Making sure to shout out the people who were performing these, whether it was a solo or a song itself, 
you know, really was showing a gratitude outward too that was very, just very moving to behold. It was just a very awesome thing to have seen. Look, I'm not saying it's on YouTube. I'm just saying it's on, maybe it's on YouTube. I'm just yeah. simply saying, do with that information what you will. LZ, glad to have you return from the gorge. I hope that your driver's license situation gets resolved. Me and Olivia Rodrigo have a lot in common. Big facts. Big facts. Vampire coming yes, soon. Let's go. Yes. Let's vamp go. Yo. Yo, talk about emergency popcast action. I am on call. We might have to record it at 12.01 a.m. right after it drops. Listen to every podcast ever at nytimes.com slash podcast. Get, first of all, get the t-shirt, get the stickers. It's the podcast.myshopify.com. I've got a couple photos of people wearing the t-shirts out. Someone sent me a photo wearing a podcast shirt at Eras Tour. Literally talk about putting a target on your back. So shout out to that individual. I'm glad that you made it home safely. Subscribe to Popcast anywhere you get your audio content. And that would be Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, etc. And YouTube, where you can also find Popcast Deluxe, which is me and Joe sitting in incredibly beautifully designed chairs, staring at each other, loggingly looking in each other's eyes and talking about this week, Luke Combs. So that's an exciting thing. Get in the Discord, get in the Facebook group, tinyurl.com slash podcast Discord or slash podcast Facebook. Send us questions for future mailbags or for podcast deluxe. Email podcastnytimes.com. Our producer is Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media. We'll be back next week. Lindsay, what song? Joni, Allison Russell. What are we listening to? It's Young at Heart. Sure is. Sure is.